Hello and welcome to the final medicine lesson. We're going to start off by doing a bit of a recall test. So over the last few lessons you've been learning about World War I medicine. Let's see how many of these 15 questions uh, you can recall off the top of your head. Okay, next, 9 to 15, I'll give you another few uh, seconds. Feel free to pause if you need it. Right. So, today's lesson, we are going to be looking at new medical treatments. So we know that the war was um, a great catalyst for medical progress and today we're going to see some of the new treatments that were introduced in order to deal with the horrific injuries brought about by World War I. Now let's start with the techniques of actually treating the wounds. What's the big problem for the wounded? Well, really, it's infection, because they may be able to sew you back up, however, they have yet to develop antibiotics. Remember, that's World War II. Therefore, if you get yourself um, hurt in any way, the likelihood of infection is extremely high. You're far more likely to die from the infection than from the wound itself. Remember that infection rates were higher as well, um, in the trenches due to the fertiliser used in the soil. So, I'd really recommend going and watching this little BBC World War I uncut clip to tell you a little bit more about infection. Now, the thing about dealing with an infected wound was that in World War I, on those trenches, aseptic surgery was just not really possible. So they had to innovate and come up with some different ways of dealing with the wound in order to stop infection. They introduced three new types of treatment to deal with a wound. Firstly, um, wound excision or debridement. And that's when you cut away the dead tissue from around the site of the wound. It had to be done as quickly as possible before the infection could set in. After excision, the wound needed to be clo um, closed by stitching. If any infected tissue hadn't been removed before the wound was stitched, the infection would spread again. You could, of course, also simply amputate. If the or the wound was too great um, and it seemed like the risk of infection was very high, amputation was best because lose a leg but save a life. By 1918, 240,000 men had lost limbs and many of them, it was simply because of infection as opposed to um, like putting the bones back together or something. Now I mentioned earlier that aseptic surgery was very difficult. You couldn't create a sterile environment. So they had to rely on antiseptic surgery methods. Remember antiseptic is when there's already germs there and you're trying to kill them. Whereas aseptic is having a sterile environment and no germs in the first place. So they went back to those aseptic methods of Joseph Lister but instead of using um, a carbolic acid gas, um, like mist being sprayed over the top of the, the wound, um, they developed this thing called the Carol Dakin method, which involved using a sterilised salt solution, uh, putting that into uh, the wound through a tube. And then the solution lasts for about six hours. Um, 
and it could be really effective. So that's how you deal with um, the infection. But of course, there were lots of other wounds to deal with. And one really important thing they had to develop was the x-ray. Now, if you remember back to the uh, first lesson, or maybe second lesson, um, there were x-rays around from about 1900. Um, Wilhelm Röntgen, a German physicist, had accidentally found out um, about the x-ray when he was conducting an experiment passing electrical current through glass. And very quickly this had been moved into hospitals, we had the development of radiology departments, so x-ray departments, and um, their use in general hospitals. Of course these early x-rays did cause a lot of problems. They, uh, the cost-benefit analysis was difficult because being radiation they, they did actually harm the patient because so much radiation was um, used. For example, they burnt the skin and they were really cumbersome. So very large machines that were very delicate that simply weren't suited to the trench environment. However, the x-ray was used from the very start of the war. It was recognised that they could be really uh, helpful in finding shrapnel, finding bullets, uh, that sort of thing before a surgery. So very quickly, mobile x-ray units were developed for use at the front. In fact, one of the leading figures in this was Marie Curie, who you've probably heard of. She was a leading Polish-French uh, scientist who's uh, very involved in uh, the development of the x-ray. Um, she recognised that x-rays were going to be really important and she put together 20 mobile x-ray vans to work in the French sector of the Western Front. And these became known as the Petit Curies, or the Little Curies. Now, these mobile x-ray units were much better than the big um, x-rays that had previously been used in normal hospitals. Although it did still take um, quite a length of time to have a, an x-ray taken, it cut it down from 90 minutes. Because the machines were fragile and quickly overheated and needed to be left to cool for an hour after use, uh, they developed a system of having three x-rays used in rotation. When a machine became too hot to continue working, it would simply be replaced by another one. And there was further advances made in the technology of the tubes in the USA, um, although this wasn't actually available until 1917 when the Americans joined the war. Now, although you have a beautiful image there of a mobile x-ray, there are actually only six of these on the British sector. They did have large static x-ray machines at base hospitals and some larger casualty uh, clearing stations. But six mobile x-ray units, it's not really that many, is it? And this uh, image gives you a good understanding of how the x-ray machine was set up. It's essentially a tent on the back of a van. And then inside the tent, you've got the the table with the stretcher and where the man would lie and then that they've got linked up to the engine of the van is the actual x-ray machine so they use the engine of the van to power the x-ray machine it's all set up inside the tent there but you can imagine probably the quality of that is not going to be great so it's better if you manage to get it to a static x-ray However, you know, surely something's better than nothing. And it was certainly sufficient to identify shrapnel and bullets. Although, of course, you still needed to ensure that you got the, um, the, like, the, the cloth, the fabric and other debris out that wouldn't be metal and therefore wouldn't turn up on the next ray. 
So now we're going to look at blood transfusions. Of course, blood loss is a major problem for any operation, and they needed to solve the problem of loss of blood in order to save the wounded soldiers. Now, before the war, there were blood transfusions. These had actually started in the early 19th century with James Blundell's experiments. Um, the problem was, however, that blood could not be stored. So they understood how to do donor-to-donor uh, -to -donor blood transfusions. So, i.e. hook your, your patient up to the donor. They could do that successfully, but that doesn't really work if you're in World War One on the trenches because you can't have that many men. Um, it, it just wouldn't be feasible to have that kind of blood transfusion occurring. So they had to innovate in order to find a way to store blood so that it was ready. They could stockpile it before a big attack and they could give the blood straight to the men without having to have a donor there as well. So the use of blood transfusions um, was pioneered by a Canadian doctor from 1915. His name was Lawrence Bruce Robertson and he was working in a base hospital in Boulogne. He used an indirect method where a syringe and tube was used to transfer the donor blood to the patient. The purpose of this was to stop the patient going to shock through blood loss before surgery. Even when a wound was relatively minor, shock could kill a soldier. Those who did not experience a negative reaction to the blood transfusion generally recovered. As blood transfusions proved so successful at the base hospital, it was decided to extend their use. Therefore, by 1917, blood transfusions were being administered in the casualty clearing stations as a routine measure in the treatment of shock. Geoffrey Keynes, a British doctor and lieutenant in the RAMC, designed a portable blood transfusion kit that was used to provide blood transfusions close to the front line. Despite Robertson's pioneering work, this kit did not use stored blood because of the difficulties in keeping the blood fresh when there was no refrigeration available. Keynes added a device to the blood bottle to regulate the flow of blood, which helped prevent clotting. In 1915, Keynes used the new method in a casualty clearing station on the Western Front. By his own count, it saved countless lives. The big breakthrough, though, was with the blood bank at Cambrai. The identification of blood groups and the use of blood type O as a universal donor blood type meant that the risk of being transfused with the wrong blood group was reduced. The problem of clotting remained, and there was never enough blood on hand to meet demand. However, as the war continued, some advances were made in the storage of blood. By 1915, an American doctor, Richard Lewisham, discovered that by adding sodium citrate to blood, the need for donor-to-donor -donor transfusion was removed. Blood transfusions could be done indirectly, with patients not needing to be in the same room. In the same year, Richard Whale discovered that blood with sodium citrate could be refrigerated and stored for up to two days. And in 1916, Francis Rue and James Turner found that by adding a citrate solution to blood, citrate glucose solution to blood, it could be stored for a much longer period, up to four weeks. The use of stored blood was clearly demonstrated in 1917 at the Battle of Cambrai. Before the battle, Oswald Hope Robertson, a British-born American doctor, stored 22 units of universal donor blood group in glass bottles. He built a carrying case for the bottles in ammunition boxes, which he packed with ice and sawdust. He called this a blood depot. During the battle, he treated 20 severely wounded Canadian soldiers with the 22 units of blood, some of which had been collected 26 days before use. They were so badly affected by shock that none of them were expected to survive. In fact, of the 20 wounded men, 11 survived. Robertson's work at Cambrai was the first time stored blood was used to treat soldiers in shock 
and although it was only on a small scale, it demonstrated its potential to save lives. This was important because during times of heavy fighting, only the most severely wounded were taken to the casualty clearing stations. The less severely wounded, who were normally the men who gave blood for transfusions, would not be taken there. Therefore, the availability of blood stored in a number of blood depots made a huge difference to men's chances of survival. We're now going to look at how they dealt with fractures. Now, during World War I, uh, leg wounds had a particularly high mortality rate. Only 20% of men who got shot or got some shrapnel in the leg actually survived. And that's because of compound fractures. Now, when a, what a compound fracture is, is when your bone pierces through the skin. So you break your leg and the bone is popping out. Now, that's really quite serious because your, your femur, your thigh bone, contains a large amount of muscle and um, there are some big arteries in your leg as well. So if you have compound fracture, it's highly likely to lead to death in World War I. They therefore needed to come up with some kind of splint that would help uh, leg injuries. Now a splint is something that basically keeps your leg um, still and supported as you get transferred to a place of medical help, medical assistance. So it's probably like a CCS. The problem with a traditional splint was that it didn't keep the leg rigid. Therefore um, you could have lots of blood loss, there was likely to be shock and likely to be infection, gas gangrene already setting in before you made it to uh, the CCS. This meant that there was a really high mortality rate and even if you did survive it would probably be thanks to an amputation of your leg. It was clear that they needed to do something to improve uh, the splint. And that improvement came with Robert Jones. Now, Jones had previously worked with his uncle, Hugh Thomas, in his medical practice. And his uncle had there de designed a splint to stop joints from moving. When the war broke out, Jones was 57 years old. He offered his services immediately to the war effort. And he worked with disabled soldiers in a hospital in London. And he started making use of his uncle's Thomas splint. As a result of this, in December 1915, he was sent to Boulogne to instruct medical practitioners on how to use the Thomas splint. The introduction of its use from this time increased the survival rate for this type of wound from 20% to 82%. And here it is in action, two further diagrams. Finally today, we're going to look at head injuries. Now, about 20% of all injuries on the Western Front occurred to the head, face, neck area, which makes sense because it's quite an exposed area. Remember also that at the start of the war, the only headgear worn by soldiers was a soft cap. They didn't actually have a helmet that would have protected against head injuries. So in 1915, they introduced the steel Brody helmet. And this hugely helped um, reduce fatalities from head wounds by 80%. Now, head injuries, of course, are often fatal. They're very serious. And this is because of the chance of infection, uh, which is, you know, the same the head as it would be anywhere else. High chance of infection. Because there were difficulties in moving unconscious men through the chain of evacuation. Think about getting them to um, a dressing station, a CCS, a base hospital. That would be extremely hard if uh, the man was unconscious in the chaos of war. And thirdly, it was difficult and there were high fatalities due to the inexperience of doctors. They had never really dealt with so much neurosurgery. 
Now, despite this inexperience, what the war does is provide a moment in which doctors are able to experiment and very quickly improve their their treatments. Now, the great pioneer for brain surgery during World War One was an American neurosurgeon called Harvey Cushing. He experimented, for example, with the use of a magnet to remove metal fragments from the brain. He also used a local anaesthetic rather than a general anaesthetic. So a local um, just numbs the, the area, the small area, the general puts you properly to sleep. So by not putting you to sleep, he was then able to stop the brain swelling which would have occurred normally as a result of general anaesthetic and so decrease the risk involved in the operation. Now Cushing based his work on observation and he observed that men who were treated quickly were more likely to survive. Therefore Specific casualty clearing stations were chosen as centres for brain surgery. For example, during the Third Battle of Ypres, all head injuries were moved to the casualty clearing station at Medingen. He also saw that it was dangerous to move men too quickly after an operation, and therefore patients remained at CCSs to recover for three weeks after the surgery. It was also realised that injuries that looked perhaps like fairly minor could actually be hiding much more severe neurological injuries and therefore all head wounds were very carefully examined. Now the result of this was that the Cushing's um, mortality rate massively decreased. He operated on 45 patients in 1917 with an operational survival rate of 71%. Well, I may not think that sounds very high, 71%. That means um, 29% die. However, compared that to the general survival rate of brain surgery, which was only 50%. Now, injuries to the face meant a much longer term um, medical treatment had to take place as well because it also meant you needed to reconstruct someone's face. So imagine a face being blown apart by explosion, shrapnel, all of those horrendous things that happened on the trenches. They had never before had that problem to deal with. So they had to innovate to find ways to help these poor men who had their faces essentially blown off. So during World War One, we get the development of plastic surgery. This is largely the work of the New Zealand doctor, Harold Gillies. Now in civilian life before the war, he had been an ENT surgeon. ENT means ear, nose and throat. He went out onto the Western Front in 1914, and there he met Charles Valadier, a Frenchman who had been working for the British Red Cross as a dentist since October 1914. Head injuries that might not kill could cause severe disfigurement, and this led Gillies to become interested in facial reconstruction, how to replace and restore those parts of the face that had been destroyed. As he had no background to this type of surgery, he devised new operations to deal with the problems that confronted him. The intricate operations and recovery that were required in plastic surgery couldn't be carried out in France. Men who needed this surgery were returned to Britain. From August 1917, the key hospital providing this type of surgery was Queen's Hospital in Sidcup, Kent. Gillies was involved in creating the design for the hospital so that it exactly matched his needs. By the time of the end of the war, just over a year after the hospital opened, nearly 12,000 operations had been carried out. And that's it, Year 10. We've covered all the content of your medicine course. Well done. <laughs>
I hope you feel a real sense of achievement. You've worked so well across uh, this lockdown. Enjoy your summer.